Good afternoon, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased you could join us for, the, for this afternoon's program. Whether you're here in the theater or joining us via Facebook or YouTube, Today's discussion, New Visions of the Future of Press Freedom, is pre presented in partnership with the Student Press Law Center. And we're pleased to welcome our panel of student journalists and our moderator, America Tonight's Joey Chen, and look forward to the discussion about the future of press freedom and their experiences of censorship and successful efforts to overcome it. But first, I want to tell you about two other programs coming up soon here in the McGowan Theater. Tomorrow night at 7. We'll present a special preview screening of episode one of the new television series, A More or Less Perfect Union, which explores the most contentious issues in American history of, of today through the lens of the U.S. Constitution. After the screening, U.S. Court of Appeals uh, Judge Douglas H. Ginsburg, the host of the television program, will hold a discussion with historian Hadley Arcus. And on Monday, February 3rd at noon, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist David Zucchino will be here to discuss and sign his latest book, Wilmington's Lie, The Murderous Coup of 1898 and the Rise of White Supremacy. To keep informed about these events throughout the year, check our website, archives.gov, or sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates, and you'll also find information about other archives, programs, and activities. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities. And you can check out their website, archivesfoundation.org, to learn more. Today, January 29th, has been designated Student Press Freedom Day, a national day of action now in its third year which seeks to celebrate the contributions of student journalists and amplify the need to fully apply the First Amendment to them and their advisors. As the home of the original Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights, we are the natural venue to host this discussion on press freedom and the important role that journalists play in our democracy. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Hadar Harris, the Executive Director of the Student Press Law Center, a human rights attorney, Hadar, joined SPLC in 2017. She previously served as the executive director of the Northern California Innocence Project. For 13 years, Harris was executive director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at American University, Washington College of Law. Earlier in her career, Harris served as executive director of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus, a bipartisan legislative service organization of the U.S. House of Representatives and under the leadership of the late Congressman Tom Lantos. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Adar Harris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to the archivist and to the National Archives and the National Archives Foundation for their partnership in holding today's event on Student Press Freedom Day 2020. First, a bit of background. The Student Press Law Center was founded in 1974 to support, promote, and defend the First Amendment rights of student journalists and their advisors. We work at the intersection of law, journalism, and education, and provide all of our services to students pro bono for free. We work with thousands of student journalists and advisors every year who call us to seek help from our free legal hotline. We provide training and educational resources to ensure that student journalists and advisors know their rights and understand the law. We work with law students to apply their knowledge to educational media settings. We also work to shift the legal landscape for student journalists and their advisors by supporting the New Voices Movement, a grassroots, nonpartisan, student-driven, state-based movement to restore student journalists' First Amendment rights after the devastating impact of the U.S. Supreme Court's 1988 decision in Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer, which I'll discuss in a moment. <clears throat> Today, on Student Press Freedom Day and beyond, we seek to amplify the voices and the important role of student journalists, young people who are learning and being trained to ask hard questions, to investigate truth, 
to understand the life of their communities, and to engage in the most important of civic duties, to report the news and to use their voices to put the spotlight on issues that are important to the community. So what are we doing here today? Three years ago, we founded Student Press Freedom Day as a national day of action, as the archivist said, to raise awareness about the incredible contributions made by student journalists, but also to focus on the challenges that they face. Events are being held all across the nation today, from Hawaii to Vermont, and we've been joined with partners from across the country to note this day, the Journalism Education Association, the College Media Association, the Associated College Collegiate Press, the Society of Professional Journalists, the Freedom Forum Institute, PEN America, First Amendment Coalition, the list goes on and on. We are so grateful for their partnership. The theme for Student Press Freedom Day this year is, this is what student press freedom looks like. And we can think of no better manifestation of student press freedom than to have a discussion about future visions of press freedom right here in the House of the Constitution and the First Amendment itself. It's an honor to be here at the National Archives, particularly at a time when censorship is a little bit on the mind of folks around here. The Constitution matters, and the First Amendment matters. But sometimes in the history of this country, the Constitution has been interpreted in ways which limit the rights rather than bestows them. This is what's happened to student journalists in this country. Some people may not know that student journalists are actually afforded a lesser level of First Amendment right protections than other students at schools. Not to get too legalistic, but this is due to that Supreme Court decision I mentioned a few moments ago, Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer. The case arose after a student newspaper, The Spectrum, at Hazelwood East High School in St. Louis, Missouri, published articles about teen pregnancy and the effects of divorce on children in their school on, on children in their school sponsored newspaper while sensitive those issues were relevant to students then and similar sensitive issues are relevant to students today yet the school administrators deemed them too sensitive and they didn't want the stories published so this case made it all the way up to the US Supreme Court where a majority of the court, five to three, found that public school administrators could censor student work for any reason, quote, reasonably related to legitimate pedagogical concerns. This carved out an exception to the previously long-held standard for free speech at schools, the Tinker Standard, which had famously said that a student or teacher's free speech rights didn't stop at the schoolhouse gates. Tinker said that student expression could only be constrained if it would result in a material and substantial disruption to school activities, if it invaded the rights of others, or if it fell into some other areas of unprotected speech like libel. And I see Mary Beth Tinker, who's the named plaintiff in that case, uh, joining us here today. We're grateful to have you here, Mary Beth. This Hazelwood exception meant that student journalists were now subject to the discretion of school administrators who would interpret on their own what a legitimate pedagogical concern actually means. What we've seen over time is that school administrators often use that discretion very liberally to censor student work which would be controversial, could be embarrassing to the school, or might even create blowback from parents or the school board. Yearbooks have been censored for pictures of kids wearing MAGA shirts or in the case of a swim team, even simply wearing a swimsuit. Student newspapers have been censored for reporting on visible graffiti or the well-known drug use taking place on campus during school hours. Administrators have censored stories which expose teacher misconduct or financial improprieties, censoring essential oversight into their own actions. And after more than 30 years of Hazelwood, students and journalism teachers have begun to internalize what will pass muster, leading them to self-censor in a way that clearly has a negative impact on journalism and certainly on our communities. There are basic issues which impact students and the community at large that student journalists want to report about. Those may be current events, they may be racial issues, they may be gender identity issues, they could be health issues, they could even be issues around the behavior of sports teams at school. 
Um, brave journalism advisors stand up for their students but they're often reassigned, retaliated against, or even in the worst situations, fired. We work with them and support them as best possible, but a generation of students have been taught to second-guess themselves because they fear censorship. They're getting the message that they should hide the truth so as not to rock the boat. And in a moment like this, when our country is in the midst of a critically important discussion about the role that independent journalism plays in educating the public and informing democratic values, teaching students to be independent, critical thinkers, and to value truth is more important than ever. So where does that leave us today and leave us in this discussion? We sit here today against the backdrop with student journalists whose entire learning experience has been curated through the prism of Hazelwood. They, however, are brave. Their advisors who've stood up for them are brave because the story of student free press is not only one of censorship and self-censorship. It's also about the core values that young people are learning through their quest to investigate their community, to expose wrongdoing, to tell important stories, and most importantly, to voice their editorial opinions. It's about standing up, telling truth, and engaging in the civic life of our communities. And as the media ecosystem has changed, we see student journalists playing more important roles than ever. College newspapers are often filling the gaps in news deserts, places where there aren't local newspapers anymore. One of those places happens to be Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm sure we're going to hear a little bit more about there. That. Student journalists are breaking national stories, like the students in Arizona who first reported on the resignation of the special envoy for Ukraine earlier this fall. And student journalists are providing important oversight regarding teacher and administrator conduct in their communities with budget and safety ramifications for everyone. So we are about to hear from some of the country's top young journalists about the struggles they face as journalists in this very polarized era where journalism is sometimes quite literally in the crosshairs, where social media amplifies and impacts their reporting and editorial decision-making, where they need to interpret and apply traditional journalistic ethics to the impact that new technology has in reality, and where the challenges are new and uncharted. It's against this backdrop, in the home of the First Amendment itself, that we're looking ahead and that we're looking to these young journalists to talk with us about what the future of a free press really looks like. Today we're joined by four leading journalists from around the country to talk about this future and their visions. Maya Goldman, the just retired editor-in-chief of the Michigan Daily and a senior at the University of Michigan. Neha Madeira, former editor-in-chief of the Eagle Nation Online at Prosper High School in Prosper, Texas, and a current staffer at the Daily Texan, where she is a first-year student at UT Austin. Christine Guillaume, a senior at Harvard University, who also is just retired as the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Crimson. And Joe Severino, the former news editor at the DA at West Virginia University, who has just joined full-time uh, uh, the Charleston Gazette in West Virginia as a reporter. We're also honored to be joined by Emmy Award-winning broadcast journalist Joey Chen, who's currently the Washington Director for Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism, but you likely know her from her expansive career on television through CNN, Al Jazeera, and a variety of other broadcast outlets. I'd like to thank the archivist, the staff at the Archives and the Archives Foundation for their partnership and their cooperation. And we hope to continue this partnership as we explore more issues of civic engagement, press freedom, and youth voices in the future. To the SPLC staff and board who have participated in planning today's event and support these efforts. To Joey, who not only agreed to moderate this when she thought we were just going out for a cup of coffee, but also helped us to produce the video that you're about to see. Um, and to, most importantly, the magnificent journalism advisors and brave student journalists who work every day to tell their stories, to find their truth, and to support and expand visions of press freedom all around this country. You will hear in a minute why I am so hopeful about the future of journalism, the future of the First Amendment, and the future of civic life and democracy in this country. 
We're fortunate to have you all here. We appreciate all of you who are watching online. Thanks again to the, um, to the National Archives for their participation. The First Amendment matters. The Constitution matters. A free press matters. And we're honored to think about the future of a free press here in the home of the Constitution on Student Press Freedom Day 2020. Thank you, and with that, we will roll the video and invite our panelists up to the front. Thank you. This is what student press freedom looks like. My name is Christine Guillaume, and I'm a senior at Harvard. My name is Joe Severino. Last spring, I graduated from West Virginia University. My name is Maya Goldman, and I was the 2019 editor-in-chief at the Michigan Daily. Today, some of America's leading student journalists speak out on the challenges they face as they try to tell the stories of their own communities. What happens when young voices are silenced? Where is the pressure coming from? The thing that shocked me most about the state of student journalism today is just how blatant and disrespectful censorship can be toward young journalists and how little schools actually value a true free student press. How does social media impact what student journalists can write or even ask about? The challenge facing student journalists is that we live and study directly on the campus that we have to report on. There's a key difference between being an activist and being a journalist. And I think a lot of the conflicts that we're seeing stem from a conflation of advocacy journalism and the traditional journalism that newspapers pursue. And how is all of this going to impact the future of journalism? How do we balance journalistic integrity with being accountable to our communities? How do we navigate the concept of objectivity? How do we decide which stories are important to tell and how do we decide who gets to tell them? This is Student Press Freedom Day 2020. Thank you. Thank you to all of you who are in the room and all of you who are watching online. It is my honor to be here with these amazing student and now professional journalist <laughs> colleagues that I have with us on the stage. I will tell you that in reading their stories and learning about the experiences they've had, I will tell you that in my entire career, I'm not sure I have faced the kinds of challenges that you have seen so early in your career. And I think What's really important in today is to understand the impact of the experience you have now as student journalists and how it's going to affect our industry going forward. Because that really is, you are the future of what we do and the storytelling about it. Um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about your individual stories. But first, I think I want to kind of work off where we started here. And I just would begin with you to ask you where you see the great challenge, the experience that you had in Prosper, Texas, and how that opened your eyes to the challenges that student journalists face. When I was in high school, you know, there was, it, the censorship that we faced was really different because it came directly from our administration. And so seeing that kind of oversight um, and learning as much as I could about fr press freedom when I was still in high school was something that really opened my eyes to whenever I came and started reporting in college because it's definitely a very different environment. I no longer face the administrative censorship that I did back then, um, and so it really opened my eyes to to the kind of uh, the amount of media literacy that people still consume in college as well. And Joe, you referred to that in the video that sense that there's enormous sense of disrespect and pressure applied to students, even at the high school level. Tell us a little bit about what you saw. Yeah, so as a reporting intern for the SPLC, um, one thing that sticks out from high school was this high school in Naperville, outside of Chicago. Um, just an award-winning paper. They have very phenomenal journalists that are there every year. And even they, they're, Illinois is a New Voices state. New Voices gives basic protections. It reverses the Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer decision, really. But even they can't escape censorship uh, by administrators. Were you shocked by that? Not really, because the story that these students wanted to report was a touchy subject. It was about a student that had a disability and that was you know, causing classroom disruptions on the daily to the point where you know, a teacher had a concussion. And so 
obviously that's a story that you know would make a school district and a principal nervous. And so this is something that they just didn't want uh, people to know about. And so, Nehal, in, in your experience, when the administration wanted greater policing, wanted to have greater authority over the kind of work that your publication was doing, was it over very controversial things? Was it a surprise to you that the they weighed in on something of this nature, that the kind of reporting that Joe's talking about? Yeah, the stories that we covered weren't very touchy. You know, the very first one was literally about a uh, us raising money for a cancer fundraiser, our administration then canceling the fundraiser and not telling um, our senior class, things like that, like very basic news stories. And then when we started to write more editorials about uh, books being removed that had uh, gay undertones, things like that, or um, National Walkout Day about protesting gun violence. Throughout all of these topics, it didn't really matter what we were going to write about as long as it kind of cast a negative light on the school. Our administration just felt that we shouldn't be writing about it and that we should be you know, valuing how our community looks at us more than just us reporting on quality journalism. Interestingly, um, Maya and Christine, you had ex you've had experiences at college as the leaders of your college publications. In both cases, these are independent publications, right? The university does not directly control as it would in, in a public high school. Mm -hmm. So your situation was somewhat different in the level of control you had. Yet there was pressure, and it wasn't always applied top down. It wasn't all about administrations telling you what you couldn't, couldn't say. What was that about? Yeah, Who put the pressure on you? I think when Christine said in the video that there's a conflation on ca college campuses between activism and journalism, I think that was really astute. Um, and I'm sure she'll talk a little bit more about her own <laughs> situations in a second. But I think that there's just like a, some dissonance between different groups on campus. Um, and it can be really hard, as Christine also said, when you're living and studying in the same spaces as, um, as your audience to to kind of separate that and... So in your case, one of the articles that became incendiary, I guess, um, was one that you shared with me and I looked at and I thought, wow, this was a rather dramatic opinion piece yeah. by one of your peers who was a columnist for your publication and you took the step to say, this is too far. Uh, it would be hard for me to outline exactly what was said in it, but it was <laughs> an opinion writer's uh, view of a campus organization, right. and the writer was extremely harsh about that organization. Mm -hmm. But you took a step, you looked at, at her writing and said, I'm going to censor this part. Uh, yeah, in, in, in a certain sense, I think there's, there was a little bit of self-censorship that went on when I was editor-in-chief because it, it's just it can be really scary to put something out into the world that, um, that you know is going to get pushback. And, and I think sometimes it doesn't always feel worth it. Um, were, were your concerns legal concerns, or were they ethical concerns, or what, what was Yeah, the... it was a mix of both. And essentially, in the, in the column, um, the columnist had written in her original draft that, she, that members of this, group, this student group were white supremacists. And, um, and after talking to some other people on my staff about it, we decided to change the language a bit because we didn't feel that there was enough proof, like evidence to back up these students being white supremacists. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was mostly a legal concern. You don't want to get sued for libel over you know, something like that. Um, but you also had an interesting situation, and you have mentioned in, in our conversations previously that it's not just what might get you in legal trouble, right. which frankly at the university level comes up a lot, the, these issues, but what might be unacceptable to your community? Right, yeah, and I don't know if you want to jump in there, but. Yeah, in your <laughs> case at Harvard too, and this has gotten quite a bit of, of national attention, um, in your case at Harvard, it had to do with your reporters seeking comment mm -hmm. from immigration officials about an immigration protest. Right. Yes, and I think that points to the conflation of sort of activism and journalism and sometimes a misunderstanding of how the press functions. Um, for us as journalists, we believe in seeking all sides of a story in order to present the fullest version of the truth. And I think 
what happened on our campus is that a request for comment became synonymous with tipping the agency off or calling the agency on the students. So what, what the concern was of the, the activists was that you are not taking our side, you are not going 100% on, even though you weren't disclosing the names mm -hmm. of any undocumented people or anything else. Yes, and we followed standard practice of reaching out after the protests had concluded and not giving any names as well because the criticisms is what's important, not the names themselves. Um, but there was still sort of a, a lot of rhetoric about how the newspaper should work to protect students or should work to sort of uplift the voices of students. And that is true, we want to tell their stories, but in order to tell them, we have to do it in a way that journalism is built to do by presenting all sides of the story to the reader to make their own conclusions. Yeah. Um, do you see that? We talk about this conflation of activism, whatever people I guess now call advocacy journalism, is it, that line seems to be moving around quite a bit. And this, I think, is true in your generation in a way that we, and I can only describe myself as being from the typewriter generation of journalists, we did not actually see this. We understood that we had a, a third party observer. This is not what your audiences expect, right? Talk to I've, about that. I've definitely heard a lot of, oh, activism is journalism. And, you know, th there will definitely be people especially on high school and college newspaper staffs who are also going to be part of different organizations that will stand for different things. But I think it's also our duty to not bring those beliefs into the newsroom, especially if you are a news reporter. Um, I think it's important that we work to protect who lives in our community, but at the same time, we have to you know, stick with our core beliefs. Um, I want to take a rip from the headlines moment. It because this has come up and, and it is just such a reflection, I think, the student experience, you guys aren't living in a bubble, it's also in the professional community. Just in the last few days at the death of Kobe Bryant, um, a Washington Post reporter retweeted a story that was not hers. She retweeted a story um, during the sexual allegations against Kobe Bryant within hours after his death. Um, and the blowback preceded her being removed by her publication, put on leave, temporary leave, for her time. It was, it was referred to as ill-timed, right? So, you know, where do you see that? Do you see that this reporter had a greater obligation to the memory of a hero in the community or a, memory, uh, or a responsibility to her publication or a responsibility to sexual assault survivors. Do you have to make that calculus when you decide, should we publish this, should, as, even as a student editor? Yeah. And how would you have decided? <laughs> Which way would you have said the greatest? Or is it the great, greatest responsibility just to tell all sides as much as you can? Yeah, I think it's, that's one of the hardest parts about being a journalist now is that calculus. Um, and you have to do it so quickly because everything is happening, you know, 24 hour news cycle, rapid, ha everything is going rapidly on social media. Um, and I don't know that there's a right answer to that question of who you're more indebted to, but, um, but I think, you know, ultimately you have to decide, you know, where, what you think, um, what you think the most important voices to uplift are as a journalist. And, and you do have a certain sense of power in this position. You absolutely do. Um, and responsibility. And responsibility, yeah. yeah. And Kobe Bryant is you know, one of the most beloved basketball players of all time. But, and, but you know, this reporter from The Post, she covers the Me Too movement. She covers sexual assault survivors. So you know, when something like that happens, you have to take into account the people that you're trying to represent. You know, we're taught to look at these marginalized communities and you know we have to you know represent them and cover them but um and it was it was very concerning to see that the post didn't have this reporter's back at the end of the day um on that reflection what is the role of campus advisors newspaper advisors faculty advisors what is their role in protecting students how important are they 
I think it's the most, I mean, I think it's the most important thing that an employer or an advisor can do just because especially, and especially in her case, the, the reporter's case, whenever her mistakes are being, you know, uh, just thrown out on social media and how ruthless people can be, I think it's extremely important for the publication to consider what repercussions she might face or what threats she might face before making a split decision about her, her job there. Yeah, it, it, Christine, you have experienced this. Mm -hmm. You've seen what backlash in 2020 looks like. Absolutely. And for us, um, when I was at the paper, a big priority for me and uh, the managing editor at the time was the constant question of how do we support our reporters? That was the number one thing that we came into the newsroom every day thinking. How do we make sure that our reporters are getting enough support amid sort of blowback and controversy? How do we make sure that we are communicating to them that you know they did everything properly um, to report the story, to make sure that they have the resources both inside and outside of the Crimson to be able to function as journalists and as students as well. Um, and so that's just a sort of mini, very, you know, much smaller scale than what happened at the Washington Post, but that's the principle that I think all editors of papers should operate by, the constant question of how do you make sure that your staff feel supported in the work that they do, especially when they get this kind of blowback for practicing ethical journalism. What if they're wrong? If they're wrong, it's still on you as the editor, because at the end of the day, we're all student journalists and we're still learning. Um, a big part of the mission at the Crimson is also about education. And I think as you assume leadership roles, it's about you know sitting down with a reporter or the reporters, um, having a conversation with them, working through the mistake and how you all can work to be better um, and taking responsibility for it as well. In your case with the, with the immigration story, how bad was that blowback? I mean, what did you see? You had hundreds of people very quickly coming out against the Crimson, and hundreds of people within your community saying, you did wrong, the Crimson. You, you've done wrong to us. Yeah, there was a petition that circulated and gained national news coverage after we reported on it. Um, we reported on it when I think it reached 500 signatures. Um, so that was sort of the type of blowback we faced, as well as blowback on social media. Um, and also that, um, I mean, that caused not only said a petition against you, but asked others not to cooperate with the Crimson yes. in the future, mm -hmm. which could really be, really be the thing that silences journalism, right? If people won't respond to you. So how do you approach that now? I mean, how did that resolve itself? There, I know that there were a number of people who said, no, we won't do interviews with the Crimson anymore. Mm -hmm. How do you resolve that? For us, it was about continuing to report, to keep reporting with due diligence, and to go out there and to find the people that would talk to us. Um, that's what we constantly told our reporters, um, that they're going to have to continue reaching out for comment because it's what we do as journalists. We want to hear what everyone has to say. Um, and we did find people who would speak to us, um, and we were able to continue reporting. And so that's what I'm most proud of with our staff. Another thought I have is that you, you have already come up against situations where people, where the audience, whatever your community is, your audience doesn't seem to share the same view of what journalists are supposed to do as we might agree is your responsibility. In your case, Maya, at the Daily in Michigan, now remember, the Daily has an unusual situation, an unusual level of prominence in the news community in your part of Michigan because there is not a lot, we say news desert, but there are not a lot of other voices in there. But you had a situation where somebody who gave a public event felt that your reporter shouldn't have been covering it, shouldn't have quoted her at it? Yeah, this, you know, it, it actually, there's something like this that happened last weekend. Um, and it happens a lot on campus where activist groups, student groups will have, you know, rallies on the diag um, and then be very upset that they're receiving media coverage on that. And well, you have to do a little translation, rallies on the diag? I'm sorry, <laughs> the, the University of Michigan has like a, a central, um, like 
commons area, which we call the so, diag. <laughs> okay, so your commons area, people have public protests, yeah. which you would generally believe right. they would want covered by journalists. Right. Um, and even if they don't, you know, it, it can be, I had a, a rather tense conversation with an organizer last weekend where I had to explain that we were allowed to be there. Um, we were allowed to be recording. It was our right to do that. Um, she said, but I'm asking you not to. And I said, well, I, you know, I understand that, but this is my responsibility as a journalist to be here. I, you know, I, I feel that this is important to cover. Um, and so I think a lot of it comes down to, to just, I don't think that the journalism industry is doing a great job right now of of educating people and empowering people to learn about journalism. So when we say media literacy, right. what does that mean, Joe? In your environment, I mean, you have said in your high school environment you didn't have journalism, you didn't have a newspaper. That means that your community isn't learning those lessons along the way either. Yeah, I just think in a large part of the country there's just a fundamental misunderstanding of what the First Amendment actually is and what the goal of news organizations are. And what do you explain to them? What do you say to people? Who well, I mean, it's, I mean, it can be like, you know, just kind of like, I'm sorry, but, you know, under my rights, under the Constitution, under the First Amendment, um, you know, we can report on anything that's public or anything like that. And uh, do people understand the value of your doing that? I mean, do your audiences say, oh, yeah, I want you to report the negative things or even the things that are just skeptical and, and questioning? I know that um, on our staff at the Daily Texan in Austin, we we respond to you know people who may not really understand what the purpose of our news organization is by also hosting panels about media literacy, about covering in the Me Too era, making it more of a, an engaging public event, so then our readers can get involved. And we've had a lot of um, issues on our campus recently that we've been covering, and it's actually been kind of the opposite where we've had a lot more solidarity because they understand that we're trying to get their messages out to not only our administration but the UT community of several issues that we're facing. When you were in high school though at, at Prosper, Texas, which is a little bit north of Dallas, mm -hmm. right, suburban area north of Dallas, in that community, did you feel that students immediately jumped on board with you? Did your colleagues, did your peers in the student community immediately understand that yeah, what you guys are doing at your high school newspaper is important, is important information. Absolutely not, just because <laughs> our, um, our paper had just started maybe two years before this whole incident, the censorship incident had happened. So it was kind of split down the middle where some people didn't even understand what we were doing or why we were um, you know, so on board with with fighting this censorship issue, and then some were just kind of like, "Oh, well, they're students. They're trying to they're trying to do their jobs. They're trying to become these professional journalists." And so, at the beginning, there was a lot more backlash. But the more that we started receiving support from the Student Press Law Center, the more that this stuff started circulating through social media. I feel like is when students at our high school started to believe that what we were doing was important. Was the essential feeling before that, though, that you really should only be reporting the good news? Um, we didn't really understand a lot about why people were so against it, I guess, at the beginning. Um, but then, you know, we made it pretty clear to even our administration that we weren't only going to be covering the positive news. And we, it's kind of weird, but we, we saw it as something that was more encouraging to us when they said, oh, well, this is negative and that's why you shouldn't cover it. We felt even more compelled to let people in our community know what was actually going on. Um, um, Joe, it, now you are reporting as a professional in West Virginia. You have talked to me a bit about uh, working in rural environments and th that perception of what news is, the literacy around what news is and what it's supposed to do. How do you address that challenge in a community that maybe doesn't have the resources to learn those things. Yeah, well luckily in Charleston, um, you know, the newspaper, the Gazette Mail, has always been a staple there. So, you know, journalism, you know, it's not, it's not left West Virginia, but, you know, um, I think of my colleague, uh, Katie Coyne at the newspaper. Um, there's a nonprofit called Report for America, and um, she was one of the first three to go to get one of these, and you know, you cover like a region like Appalachia. She covered Southern West Virginia, 
And uh, you know, to be able to go down there to these people who've, who no one's spoken to in a long time, and to go and have them invite you into the into their home and let them tell you their stories. The she had an award-winning series on just drinking water in West Virginia. There's a town in West Virginia called O'Toole. Um, they've been under a boil water advisory since 2002. You know, and you think in you know the 17, 18 years that that's happened, they could they could go out and tell their story to someone, but. No one was there to listen. But now, you know, us young people are stepping up and going into these areas and telling those stories. Likewise, Maya, I mean, News Desert might not be the perfect description of Ann Arbor, but still an information void at some level. Yeah, yeah. It, we have, so the, the Michigan Daily is the only daily print paper in all of our county. So there are other news sources who are, you know, covering it, but we tend to do just because we're a daily paper and we have a lot of reporters and we have a very large staff we're lucky enough to so we do a lot of coverage of the city of ann arbor and and a lot of times you know it, it can be difficult to cover <laughs> adults as as a student um you know i personally and i, I haven't had you know m many problems with feeling disrespected but i think that's something that reporters do deal with sometimes is is just adults not not thinking that they can trust you because you're a student. Yeah. Um, and also not accepting what your role is. And both of right. you have a situation like that. Um, you had the situation with an author who felt that she shouldn't be quoted even though she was speaking at a public forum. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the Crimson, um, you had a situation with a, uh, a faculty leader who felt that you, your newspaper didn't take his side and maybe that was supposed to be your responsibility? Tell us a little. Yeah, um, I think it can be really dangerous when actors in your community try to dictate what your coverage should be. Um, we had a situation on campus where there were student protests occurring in the spring of 2019, um, protesting a faculty dean who had um, decided to represent Harvey Weinstein in his Manhattan sex abuse trial. Um, for context, a faculty dean is a sort of a, the head of a residential house at Harvard. He's an academic leader, in this case, somebody with a full professorship, a, a great deal of stature and mm -hmm. status. Yeah, um, and we covered the protests, we covered the controversy. Did you take a side? Did you write uh, opinion pieces saying Professor should not be Professor Sullivan should not be uh, not be assisting in Harvey Weinstein's defense. Did the Crimson take a side? So the editorial board, which is okay. separate from the news board, did um, and opined in favor of the protesters. Um, and uh, Dean Sullivan sent an email, or former Dean Sullivan now sent an email to his house criticizing both the Crimson's news coverage and the editorial coverage, saying that the editorial coverage was biased and that the news coverage didn't fully represent his side of the story. When we had, in our reporting, reached out for comment um, on the, uh, to him on the issue uh, multiple times. Um, so that was definitely interesting to see an attack on the student newspaper coming from an admi a top administrator at the college. Um, and concerning to us as student journalists to see that kind of behavior sort of take place in a place that we, we as the Crimson, are very sort of used to being considered independent for a long time. Um, so that definitely rocked our boat a little bit at the time. This, uh, the thing that strikes me is this is a person who has national stature in the legal community, certainly. He's at Harvard, he's a faculty lead there. If these people don't understand what the role of a free and open press is, how can we expect that high school administrators can look at the reporting of their students with an eye to what your, what your role in democracy is? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think I brought this up. We had talked a little bit about this before, obviously, and I think I brought up how um, I thought that there were two different types of people who censor publications, but I think that can also apply to just people who don't really support journalism publications overall. And the first is, you know, people who don't really even understand what the role of a newspaper is and things like that. But then there's also the kind who ignore that and care more about 
their community. And as student journalists, I think that we also, we need to understand why they care about that. Like obviously they work, they work there, like it's important that they want to keep their jobs there and they want to protect their community as much as they can. But again, it comes back down to those core beliefs that no matter what anyone says, we have to make sure we have all sides of the story covered, whether or not that casts the, the university, the high school, or whatever that may be in a negative light. Um, can you play devil's advocate on this? Is there a logic to saying, OK, but it is different, because we are living in the community, because this is our, we're reporting on our classmates. We are reporting on people who share our literally share our living situation. We look at you every day. Is there a difference between what you should be doing as student journalists and what you would do as a professional? Where your responsibility? Is there, is there some legitimacy to that argument when those kinds of activists speak to you about that? I, I don't think it's any different than any small town paper. Um, like being, in a, being at a college paper, because I think at any paper that takes itself seriously, they should be talking to their community um, and, and kind of working to build the trust of their community and become enmeshed in their community. Um, and I think that's how a good paper you know, functions. That's how the best journalism is created. Um, that said, it can be really, really difficult to go to class and sit next to someone who's attacking you on social media. Um, <laughs> And I don't know that, that ne that's necessarily the same as you know, going to the local restaurant and being seated at a table next to someone like that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, for me, it always meant that you know, we were a paper that took ourselves seriously, but also that it meant that you, if you're going to be living and studying next to the people that you're covering, you should work as hard as you can to get it right. And that would be sort of my advice to any student journalist, work as hard as you can to get the facts, to get all sides, and to get them right. And when these types of controversies occur, um, be transparent with your readership. For us, when the whole, um, when Dean Sel former Dean Sullivan criticized us, we reported on that. Um, and my role as president also functioned as spokesperson, and so I put out a statement where I said, you know, the Crimson works diligently to report with accuracy, integrity, um, and a responsibility to the facts. And on the editorial side, which is entirely separate from our news side, because that's another thing that I think in the controversy that you're talking about, sometimes the wall between news and editorial isn't generally understood by the public. And I think we see that in national publications too. And making it clear to your readers that, hey, these two things are, are completely different and they're being conflated right now. Um, so I think there's, a responsibility to get all of the facts and to present them as accurately as possible. And also when these types of conflicts occur, to be transparent and to report on yourself and make it clear to your readers what you're trying to do and why it's important. I've referred to um, your experience being reflected in the national stage and the national press, but also their world is reflected in yours, right? I mean, the, the, and I, I think about these recent um, dust-ups, both the issue with the Washington Post and the Kobe Bryant case, as well as uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and the conflict with the NPR reporter Mary Louise Kelly. And I, I y yes, you live in a microcosm, but your microcosm is particularly aggressive because so much of it is guided by social media. What was that experience like for you? I mean. That, People, are, people get really nasty on social media, I think, is the way we could describe that. Yeah, I think the big issue with social media is that it can often be an echo chamber. Um, and I think social media has sort of um, impeded our ability to appreciate the listening to other sides or different perspectives or multiple perspectives on an issue. Um, and so when you're sitting, you know, in your lecture or dorm room reading through a Facebook feed that is one side of story that is blowback against you, that can be really difficult. Um, but so that was def definitely a hard experience, um, but one that I've definitely learned from. And I think just seeing sort of the echo chambers manifest in my own experience helped me to have more clarity on why it's so important to get multiple perspectives on a story and why it's important to make sure that you're engaging with all arguments 
um, because that's how you can sort of make the, your own conclusions the best way. I think it's also really important to emphasize though that we're people and so whenever we are scrolling through social media, like for me I was able to leave my high school and go to another city and literally escape that, but it can still be really hard when you're surrounded by a community who is just sending you backlash without even maybe really understanding the full scope of what you're going through. And so obviously everyone talks about, you know, thinking before you say something online, but that's not really present most of the time. Um, and so I do think it's really important to, to emphasize that there is a problem there with that and it can also come down to a gender issue or if you are a person of color or just random things like that, I feel like can also be small things that people will attack you with and will pile on to you about. Yeah, the, the pressures around that, uh, I read a study from the International Women's Media Foundation uh, saying that 40% of the women that they spoke to have experienced such significant online harassment at all levels that they will actually censor themselves, choose not to cover certain stories. And of course, every day as a journalist, you make a choice, right? I'm going to cover that story or I'm going to cover that story. My editor is going to let me do that. I'm going to drive over here to get that story. I am going to choose to interview this person or that person, but I don't have time to do both. We always make those decisions. But what happens when those decisions are being guided by our fear of how this is going to blow up. Well, on the other end of that, we had a, a young female reporter cover a story about fraternities on campus this semester, and you know they were breaking some university policy. And I talked to, um, to a professional journalist beforehand to get some advice, and she said have her disable all of her social media before the story is even published to, wow. to avoid some of that. Um, and she, we didn't end up getting as much blowback as we thought we might get, but you know, I did have her make her Twitter private for a few days, and yeah. Um, you know, I think about all of you have very high profiles within your communities. Uh, Neha has done a TED Talk, which to me, it's so intimidating to me to think about doing a TED Talk, but I can't imagine being your age and in your life experience to stand up uh, with a colleague, but to stand up and give a TED Talk on an issue that was clearly important to you around your press freedom. Joe, you are a significant person in your community, a smaller community, but you're going to be identifiable for everything you write and do because you're going to be the big fish in the small pond. Maya, similarly, with the Michigan Daily, Christine, I mean, before you became editor, you were already people writing about you in the New York Times. Your profiles are substantial within whatever community you're in. How does that change your sense of responsibility in what you're writing about, in what you're thinking about, in what you're saying, and what you're willing to publish? I'm a freshman um, <laughs> at, at King College, and so she's I, a freshman at college. She's already done her first TED talk. I no, I think it's it's very frightening, honestly, to tell the to tell you the truth, just because it's um, you know after we came, I came from such a small little conservative white town and that was and you know coming to Austin which is very different from that it's still it can still be a little scary because I'm on a staff of several people who don't really know anything about it but the people who read my stories might and so it's definitely there's a balance of choosing which fight I want to fight and what I say on social media I'm very I'm a lot more aware of than that of, of that than I used to be um, and things like that but I I definitely feel a deeper sense of security when thinking about other students and if we as a paper are receiving backlash, I think about the situation that my small staff was in and what I would do. And I, I definitely consult with my editors in that way, but I, I have to admit I kind of do take a step back and like let them do their, do their thing. Let them stand up for that. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I mean, we're journalists, we have to, we just have to Sit there. We don't have to sit there and take it, but I mean, people, social media is, is nasty, and I mean, that's just something you're going to have to deal with, and, you know, people are always going to say something about that you write, but, I mean, you can't let that dictate any of your coverage. I mean, we're still journalists. We still have to put up with, you know, the, the haters and people that, you know, like, well, why aren't you writing about this? Why aren't you writing about this? I mean... We just have, have you encountered this already as a professional, this sort of fake news? Oh, Joe, what are you doing? You're joining up with fake news. Have you, have you faced that yet? Not really. I mean, I'm only like a few weeks in, yeah. so. 
but but you have gotten your first paycheck, so that means that yeah, you're yeah, first direct deposit hit. There so. you go. <laughs> <laughs> but but that do you have that sensation that okay, I, you know, within the community, they, they're going to be people who have heard language spoken at the top levels of our country, claiming that what you do as a journalist, you're just purveyors of fake news. Yeah. In the city of Charleston, where I'm actually, I'm be reporting on the city, we haven't really had someone dedicated full time to the city in you know, a long time. So I mean, I've got tons of people who are coming to me with just story ideas. Like no one's really been here to you know, listen to us. So in the event, like if I want to start on something, they're like, oh, why aren't you, why aren't you been covering this? I came to you two weeks ago with this story idea. Like, why don't you go on this? I mean, there's just so much to do. And so I, I think that you have to consider that as well. I mean, there's just so much news out there. It's hard to, it is kind of hard, you know, just to, to find, you know, which ones you actually want to report on. And which ones you can get done. Yeah. I think that can be one of the really tricky parts about journalism is, you know, if you cover a certain one story, you have to decide not to cover a different story because we have limited time and resources, and and that you know sometimes I felt like I'm missing out on on another really good story because I want to do this one, or my editor tells me that I need to do this one, and um, and I think that you know that can you know, we need more journalists so that we can cover more stories, and we need more journalists in different communities so that they understand what the stories are about. That's yeah, I think this is true, but let's talk about diversity for a moment, and one of the things we have said about diversity for many years in newsrooms is we need greater diversity because we need people to tell stories that are not being heard. I'm all about that, but I'll also say to you that we also run the risk of siloing right around communities, and I think we started to see this, evident, this become evident in different communities. Oh, well, you're mine? You're part of my tribe. You should be reporting my story. And that puts a pressure on you as well. Yeah, I think definitely there can be sort of that expectation um, when you come from a marginalized background that you're going to sort of be more favorable. Um, and I think that when I think of myself as a journalist, I don't think like black female journalists. I mean, that's not like. The, the identifier that like is reigning in my head. But what I do think is valuable about having diversity in newsroom and being from a marginalized background is that I can bring that perspective into the room, um, help to sort of shed light on stories that do go untold and to tell them fairly and to tell them in a way that um, can bring them to a broader audience. Um, for us, we when I was at the Crimson, we constantly thought about diversity and how we can improve the diversity of our staff. And uh, one thing that we thought about a lot was sort of the language that we use in reporting. Um, so we, last year, um, we had a diversity sort of task force make a style guide to cover marginalized groups and to cover them with the right language, sort of to train reporters to go in and ask sources, how do you identify? What are your pronouns? And I think regardless of what background you come from, those are valuable skills that contribute to, di to diversifying, A, the staff of a newspaper, and B, the stories that we cover. And that, I think, should be a goal of journalists going forward. I know in the text, and we have a diversity and inclusions board as well. And so it's really nice for us as staff members to be able to go up to, to other staffers who are a part of this and say, hey, you know, I've, I've heard about this issue on campus, and I know that no one's really being able to cover it, things like that, but also when we have our friends, our readers come up to us about things that we have not been able to cover, our editors you know, told us to cover something else, that's also something that's really nice. No, but is there also, though, the question of, you know, I cannot, I cannot culturally appropriate coverage in a community that is not mine? I mean, does that, that, does that challenge also reach into your world now? I don't think there's necessarily, like it doesn't necessarily feel like cultural appropriation when you're covering a different community, but I think there's something to be said for building trust, especially quickly if you need to do that. Um, I think it can be really difficult to come into a community that you're not a part of and just expect people to talk to you. And, and so you don't necessarily, I definitely don't think that journalists need to have a certain identity to cover any specific story, but I think we shouldn't underestimate, you know, shared but identities. To return well. to that self-censorship, though, right. question, like, am I in the right position 
to be, do I have the right basis of experience to ask the question of a community that I don't come from? Right. I, I think, you know, it, it's a case by case issue, I think. Um, and, I, you know, I, I would never tell a reporter at the Daily that they can't cover a story because they don't have a certain identity. But and I would also never tell a reporter that they have to cover a story because they have a certain identity. But, you know, I think that we should be giving people opportunities that they want. And I think a lot of times reporters at the Daily want to cover their own communities, I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah. I think no matter what about, oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I think in these cases, it's often about admitting what you don't know. Because if you are going to cover something that you're unfamiliar with in any, in any case, whether it's a new community, whether it's like a, a committee that you have no idea about, or like some investigative piece that you just don't have any background on, it's about as a reporter admitting what you don't know and asking questions of your editors, asking questions of your other colleagues who may have more expertise in that area. Um, because that, that can go a long way to, I think, just trying to educate yourself and do your own research as much as possible before taking on a story that you might be more, le less familiar with. Um, because if you come in, I think if you come into a, setting, a new setting, a new environment, and you demonstrate to your potential sources that you want to know, you want to know for good reason, and you want to understand as best as possible because it's a big part of our job to, to understand as much as possible, um, then I think Does that it goes limit, a long Do you way. limit yourself in any way when, you, when you're thinking, gee, maybe I don't have the authority to speak on the world of central West Virginia, or I don't, have, I don't have the authority, I don't have the experience, I don't have the understanding to grasp fully the complexity of whatever issue it is, whether it's water, you know, in West Virginia. I mean, I know water, but I don't know the life that people have lived for 20 years not getting clean water, right? Well, I think no matter what you're covering, it's important, like she said, to do your research before you do it, because your readers are going to be in the same position as you most likely, where they're not even going to know much about the topic. So by you going out of your way to cover that and to learn as much about it as you can and provide that to your readers, that's also giving them a full perspective of of what's going on, since not everyone's going to be in your situation, obviously. Yeah. Do you think, Joe? I mean, looking around you, do you do you understand the? There, there's kind of both things that happen in the audience, right? Like nobody ever covers us, and the other thing is you don't have any business covering us because you don't know what you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to have an expertise on anything, or you know, a particular insight on everything. And I think that's just the beauty of journalism. I mean, we can go out and talk to these people and and you know, and tell their stories. And because, you know, if you don't know a lot about something, there's a good chance that a, a ton of other people don't know about it, especially if it has to do with, you know, people who live in marginalized groups or historically ma marginalized. So, I mean, I think that's just really our job, is to go and tell these stories. And, you know, and that's where we have to do it responsibly, especially as young people who, who do make mistakes, but we still have to hold ourselves, you know, accountable. You guys are all tremendously thoughtful. And I wonder how you've considered what we do to preserve free voices, free speech, free coverage in the future. Not only limited to your own experience, but to those in the broader journalism community, in the broader listening audience, and viewing audience, and reading audience. How do we make that better? Number one, we have to pass new voices protections in every state, and you know we have to we have to give high school journalists the same rights as regular journalists because I mean that's the standard that high school journalists should hold themselves to is to be you know the same as professionals. So we have to do that, and I think you know when we start when we get into places you know states like West Virginia, Kentucky, you know Appalachian states that you know high schools usually don't have journalism programs. I think you know we make a concerted effort to you know, start teaching kids journalism and start, you know, teaching about the First Amendment and, you know, getting high levels of media literacy going at a young age. I think that is really, you know, just the easiest place to start. Is there a recognition that, um, that teaching that is important in those, particularly at the high school level, those environments? I wonder if there is enough priority placed on having teachers or advisors of publications who actually have had professional experience and therefore can't be, or 
even if they don't, just people who have been focused on journalism, because I will tell you that my high school journalism teacher, Mr. Reckway, is still the paragon to me of what the rules are, how we do this. He was not a practicing journalist, but he, and he has said to me since, you know, I envied you for going out there and doing it, but I think those people are so important because they stand up for their students, because they teach you what the standards are, but do schools, school districts, universities even appreciate the value of having a very focused journalism teacher, or do you see them? I think that a lot don't, actually, just because I know that, for me personally, I will give credit to my journalism teacher for every single thing that I've done in journalism until now. <laughs> Since before before I took her journalism class, I knew nothing. I didn't I didn't really know what I was doing. I wasn't consuming the news as much as I am now. Just there's there's so many layers to that. And then um, obviously we as a staff have told our story several times about what happened with her job and things like that, but that happens a lot and it's even at a college level it's important to recognize the roles of the higher ups who are in journalism who are teaching you what you know because it obviously starts there and I think that when we start um, you know having not just journalism teachers but people who are teaching um, that same content media liter liter literacy to children at such a young age it can it can kind of be a foundation for them as well it doesn't have to be as as quick as it was for some of us and that's why we need protections for advisors too. you know talk yeah. about the journalists I mean he went at schools where, you know, in Naperville, this advisor is still feared for his job. I mean, you know, this paper wins awards every 10 years, and even if Illinois is a new voice of states, there's not that many protections for advisors. And I mean, I mean, schools can say, you know, we, you know, we support journalism, but when there is like a controversial story or anything like that, you know, these advisors' jobs are on the chopping block, and you know, we have to have legal protections because the school can say, oh, you know, we support them, but I mean, at the end of the day, when you know, when push comes to shove, we, they need, there needs to be a legal protection for these people. I think you, oh, sorry. I think no, you, your <laughs> advisor is no longer teaching. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you see that a lot at a high school level, and that's something that we didn't know. I know that the whole time that we were fighting against our censorship, our advisor, our former advisor, did not want to get involved at all because she knew what was going to happen no matter what, but at the same time, we didn't understand that because all we could see was you're putting everything out on the line, your, your job, your reputation, everything for us, and that's something that we are going to be grateful for forever. And so I guess our staff and other staffs who face those same kinds of repercussions and see what their advisors go through, now we feel even more empowered to fight for not just journalism teachers, but teachers overall, because, again, they're the reason why we're here. And for you, who did not have, you have independent publications, so you're not specifically guided by professors. And you don't have a pure journalism school at Harvard at all. And you're Michigan, not, you're yeah. in Michigan either. Um, what is the role of those educators, though, in what you do and what you will do professionally? I can say at Michigan, um, we are lucky enough to have a, a fellowship of professional journalists on our campus. I think Harvard does too, actually. Um, and that's been really, really helpful, especially in recent years. You know, we had a, a situation last year where we needed a lot of professional <laughs> advice quickly, and we were able to kind of organize a roundtable discussion where we brought all of these really esteemed professional journalists into our newsroom and talk to our editors and they weren't telling us what to do. They weren't telling us this is what you, this is how journalists do it, but they were giving us just their advice and talking about their own experiences dealing with similar things and that really helped us create our own protocols. Um, and the value of the Student Press Law Center. Right, and, oh yeah, I leaned on Student Press Law Center a lot as editor. Um, so those, like these were resources you even are aware really that those kinds of organizations, SPLC or other organizations, were you aware of, of these organizations going into your editorship, or that you would even need to call anybody for something like that? You couldn't possibly have thought, oh, I'm going to be calling someone in Washington and asking for legal help. Um, yeah, I think I found out about it when I we had a as when I was a news editor, we'd had like a, maybe a, a story that we thought needed some legal guidance and um, reached out to a local lawyer who said, oh, you know, this is a resource that's available to you. 
Christine, did you know what you're getting into here? Uh, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, we are lucky enough to also have a great uh, alumni community. Um, so we're able to reach out to our predecessors and ask them similar, similar relationships, sort of like, kind of we'd like to hear your thoughts and advice. And they don't tell us directly what to do, but it's good to he hear from them. Um, the Neiman Foundation is also on Harvard's campus and is a great community of esteemed professional journalists um, who showed that support this semester and who like we've reached out to to sort of uh, get some advice or even just to help train our photographers, sort of teach them about photojournalism, things like that. Um, so I think um, those resources on campus are really important. Uh, especially when I feel like with journalism can be so unpredictable sometimes. You really don't know what you're getting into or what will happen when you wake up tomorrow. So definitely a big help. Yeah, I think there's a lot of pride at the Daily and I'm assuming at the Crimson of being a student-run paper, like not having an advisor and you know being kind of on our own as 20-year-olds. But there's also an understanding that we just can't do it alone and we need mm -hmm guidance of mentors, and that's what helps us get through. The best decisions are never made alone. Right. So. Um, and the best, best voices are never told in, the, in an echo chamber and alone either. And to that end, I do want to encourage those of you who have questions to step to the microphones uh, so that you can pose your questions to our panel. Um, and you can do that now as you wish. But I wonder if you have advice to the college community college faculties about what we could be taught, whether it's within a journalism school or throughout some sort of civics. I know that there has been an effort in many places to reduce civics as at the high school level. Joe, you and I have talked about that in West Virginia. People actually try to reduce that. But what, what should we be teaching now? Maybe that's quite different than anything that was taught back in the typewriter age. What should we be teaching now? I think that we, we all keep saying media literacy. That's something that's extremely important, not just to university students, but faculty, everyone really. Literacy in what sense? I mean, what does that mean, literacy? Well, not just the importance of, the importance of journalism is overall how we, how journalism is a cornerstone of our democracy and how vital it is that it exists. But then also at a student level, the work that we're all doing, and there are several examples of that all over the country, honestly, probably all over the world, of how our stories help communities and providing students and faculty who may not really understand that, showing them those stories and showing them how we've reported on so many different topics that have made national news, that I think is a direct example of, of what we are trying to do here and that we're not just you know, kids reporting on whatever they want or things like that. I also think that in addition to what you just said, we also need to talk about misinformation and the way that it's pervaded our society um, and teach people how to navigate that and how to make sure that they're looking at credible sources. Um, because that's another thing with social media currently, not only is it an echo chamber, but things tend to spiral out of control and different versions of the truth emerge that are just completely out of left field. And I think that in addition to teaching why journalism is so important, teaching sort of about the forces that are currently posing a danger to the integrity of journalism is also equally crucial. And this is kind of neither here nor there, but it does it does apply to journalists a little bit. Is that whole cancel culture thing that you know that's prevalent in okay, every explain single? Explain cancel culture <laughs> to those of us of a previous age. Um, it's basically I mean it's basically whenever people on social media jump on this topic that someone needs to be canceled or someone needs to lose their job or things like silenced. that. Silenced. So, yeah, silenced because. Um, they made a mistake or they did something that the general public didn't like and that can that can apply to any workspace and that I think is something that we're all aware of that's is something that's really toxic and so making sure that we're aware of issues like that and uh, avoiding that is something that needs to be talked about as well. Did you have any reluctance to being part of this conversation? Um, particularly you know those of you who've already been sort of public in controversy. Did you have any question? Because I mean, here we've hashtagged you. I presume there's some social media conversation about this. But do you have reluctance to go back out and talk, having lived the experience that you have in 
just trying trying to tell a story? Nah, I, I want to talk about student journalism all the time. <laughs> really, I mean, it's just something that's that's so important, and you know. Journalism in the media it just plays such an important role nowadays, and I think there's so many factors to it. So, I mean, I just want to talk about, you know, just the role. I mean, we're only going to have good journalists if we invest in them at a young age, and we, you know, give them the legal protections, and we give them the resources to succeed. And if we don't do that, we're just going to get more of what's happening now. It's just a very nasty civil discourse. And I mean, we used our, as a staff, as a high school newspaper staff, we used the Student Press Law Center's advice for like two years, I'm pretty sure. Mike and Hadar were our best friends for that entire period of time and so for me it's kind of a way to give back and also show people what we've learned and how we are so thankful to them, the journalism education, so it's like all these other different resources and it's, we're all really grateful I feel like to be on this platform and to, to provide student journalists all these different things. But you wouldn't self-censor, maybe maybe not in this environment, but would you self-censor in, in other social media platforms, maybe I, I don't want to say anything about the Kobe controversy. I don't want to say anything about the NPR controversy. I don't want to say it because the blowback is just going to be, yeah, I don't need it. I don't know if for me it's the blowback. I generally stay off social media. That's just something that I think, you know, observing the way that social media can work, um, I just, I think it's easier to just stay off it. Not for self-censorship, it's just more convenient. Self-preservation, <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> but that is, I mean, that is a form of censorship, right? That is a form of, uh, of feeling that this is, this takes up my energy in a way that maybe I, you know, Joe truly believes that student journalism is important, but he might say to himself, on the other hand, I'm gonna shut off my Twitter feed for a couple days because I don't need to be involved in that. Uh, no, <laughs> nothing's going to stop you. <laughs> no, I, I definitely think that I will silence and private all of my social medias very frequently now just because it's something that, and it's so specific, but I feel like no matter what you're doing, if, if you're going to go out there and talk about it, people are going to talk about you and people aren't going to like you for whatever reason, and that's something that we all have to take into account. Um, so I'll definitely find myself thinking about how I'm not going to talk about something like this or another event until it's over mm -hmm. just because I... It, it can attract negative attention, and I feel like that's that's something that we you know think about beforehand. You internalize. Yeah. Um, Mike's got a question for you. Just piggybacking on the technology thing there. Um, I mean, it seems like we were in this real period of transition, kind of going from printing presses to typewriters to radio to TV to wherever we are right now. Um, and I'm just curious. I mean, um, are, what do you think you know your job is going to look like in, in ten years? And you know, are you optimistic? Uh, about kind of where we are going as a profession. And you're choosing journalism, so that's a good sign, right? I, I am optimistic. I think um, I didn't realize before I decided to go into journalism how vast the field was and how many different opportunities there were within journalism because a lot of people who aren't in tune to the media world say, oh, you're going into journalism, newspapers are dying, you're mm -hmm. never going to find a job. But I just don't think that's true. I think the jobs just look very different than they might have 20, 30, in the time 50 range. years ago. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sir? So I'm, the, I'm the advisor for a um, newspaper at an independent school, and actually a couple of our student journalists are with, with me today. And uh, I'm curious to know how you all wrestle with the difference between news and opinion, because one of the things that we've discovered over the years is that, you know, students, again, we're a high school, not a college, but the students will start to write a news story, but it's very easy to devolve into an opinion piece. And so we've tried to educate them about the difference. And we also, a couple of years ago, started labeling stories as news or opinion or, you know, arts or sports or whatever, so the reader has kind of an immediate idea of what he or she is going to see. Um, but and it's harder on a digital platform, too, because it all just looks like a page, right? This page, uh, unless you do one page in black and one page in white, it, it's, it kind of looks like it can run together. I know from the get-go. I know from the get-go our news writers can't write opinion pieces. Like That's just like a blanket rule for all of us. But then also on social media we're aware of the fact that especially if we're writing about 
topics that are trending on Twitter or trending on whatever platform, we're not going to retweet or like or, you know, engage with um, posts that favor one side just because that shows our readers that we're not sticking with our core beliefs. Yeah, similarly, we um, have a separate editorial staff from our new staff, and you're not allowed to be on both at one time. And I think um, something at my high school newspaper was that sometimes there was crossover between the two, but the people that write and edit those pieces, I had actually had a recent conversation with my high school newspaper advisor about this. The people that write and edit news pieces shouldn't be the same people that write and edit opinion pieces, and that helps to sort of um, solidify the divide. I think continuously, just I said this a little earlier, but communicating to your readers that there is indeed a wall is important. Yeah, one thing, we haven't actually implemented this at the Michigan Daily, but um, from time to time we've talked about, in addition to just labeling everything opinion piece or column, um, including kind of a disclaimer at the top, like a note that says the opinions in this article are the view of the writer. Um, and right, not, not necessarily, the yeah. right. Can you turn it off? Could you say in your mind, this particular writer will always be a flamethrower, but not substantive, and therefore I'm going to eliminate that writer or exclude them, not invite them to, to be an editorialist, even, even in the editorial sphere of my publication? Um, I, one thing that we always say at the Michigan Daily is, you know, it, as long as your opinions are backed up by fact um, and you're making logical fact-based arguments, we're not going to silence you. But if, if, there's, if there's a columnist or a writer who's repeatedly not doing that, then yeah, then we would discuss that. Discuss I guess that, that can be tricky though, just because obviously you don't want to blatantly silence a writer for that when we, we might be struggling with that same thing from our higher ups. So it's definitely a battle, but sometimes I think it can be, it can kind of be common sense of, of you know, who should be writing what stories and things like that. Yeah, and in the academic environment, I think that that is going to be different, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've hired for a professional journalism institution somebody to write editorials, then you have hired them to write editorials. Presumably, you're going to have a lot of history around them. But in an academic setting, these are people in your community who come with opinions, whether you happen to agree with them or not, whether you agree with their style or not, whether you agree with how harsh they are on a particular issue or not, they're part of your community in the same way that you might be reluctant to write a story and then have to sit next to her, you writing and excluding a columnist who comes to you saying, this is just my opinion, I'm writing my opinion, and I'm entitled to it because I'm part of that community. Yeah, yeah they, I agree, they are, as long as they're writing a fact-based mm -hmm. piece, yeah. And we fact-check all of our opinion pieces as well as our news stories, so, yeah. And what is your publication? Oh, it's called The Page and the Epistle, uh, and it's, it's published by the St. Paul Schools in Baltimore County. And that, these are your student journalists? Yes. Good for you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions, sir? Yes, hi, I'm just a citizen. I have a question, I'll try to make it brief, but as you can probably guess, it's gonna take a minute. Um, about a mile from here, they're making uh, decisions regarding constitutionality, and uh, you probably know what case I'm speaking of. Um, my question is, a lot of the local news organizations cover both sides, they figure it's safe, they'll just have what the Republicans say, what Democrats say. What I noticed NPR and public media do is they bring in outside people, obviously they have some opinion or bias, but they say, well, here's what the Constitution, and I'm a constitutional professor, says. To me, that's a lot better than just having, like saying both sides of the issue, actually have more than both sides of the issue. And so I would hope that you're, you know, I'm just inviting comments, that what your requirements are for your own journalism, that you'd want to go outside of the echo chamber, if you will, and actually talk to independent people, even if you do or don't like them, but and even if you do or don't say they're really experts in their field, you could ask for their advice or opinion and even put them on air. That, to me, would be, make it much more informed public. I was right. wondering what, what you It goes to, what you're saying goes to, I think, something that has been said in the general journalism community, sometimes not just providing both sides isn't actually reporting fairly, mm -hmm. which might be a different, you know, when we talk about what is media literacy, maybe understanding that should also be part of that conversation. Because at the end of the day, someone, someone, someone's going to be right and somebody's going to be wrong. I mean, that's the old analogy, like if somebody tells you, 
two people different tell you like it's raining or whatever, your job is to go to the window, and and that's still <laughs> like that's one of those things from old journalism that will, it either is or it isn't. Yeah, that's one of the things from just you know journalism that it's gonna last forever. I mean, it's like it is basic and as that analogy is. I mean, that's I mean you can't get away from that. Just because two people are yelling at you very loudly doesn't mean that one of them is you know right, or it doesn't mean that both of them you know their arguments carry the same weight if one of them is factually incorrect. Hi, so I'm Shivani, and I'm an ESC of my, of my school newspaper up in Rockville. It's a high school newspaper, and I'm here with two of my editors. Um, my question kind of concerns the idea of, like, your relationship with administration, because what we've kind of struggled with a lot in the past is, like, publishing articles that might criticize an administrative decision or something like that, but still being able to, like, actually interview administration and, like, get the facts and things like that. So how do you kind of balance, like, being able to criticize your administration while still maintaining a good relationship with them. I know for us at, at our high school, we we didn't really have the opportunity to build a relationship with our administration before we started facing problems with them already. But I think that that's something that you that high school staff especially really need to think about. Maybe at the very beginning of the year, setting up a meeting with your administrators, administrators talking to them about your goals as a paper, as any other journalism publication, and then keeping up with that throughout the year. So when you do face problems that may or may not criticize their decisions or the school's decisions overall, you still have that support. And if you lose it, at least you tried, you know? Yeah, I, this is actually reflected in the current days with Secretary of State Pompeo and NPR's Mary Louise Kelly his contention is you agreed, whether this is true or not, but his contention is you agreed only to talk about X, only to talk about Iran, not to talk about Ukraine, and then you agreed. So at what level is there a similar parallel, right, in that world where, okay, Mr. Principal, I'd like to ask you about this. Do you, can you make those agreements as student journalists, and do you have a different obligation to your administration than a public radio host with a secretary of state. Is there some, can you cut that deal? Well, whenever you, I feel like you're going to go meet with your administrators, you're not going there to go sign an NDA. You know what I mean? Like you're going to tell them that you are, this is my job as a journalist and I, we're meeting with you because we want to have a good relationship with you. We're not attacking you. It's not students versus administrators or students versus yes, the community. Yes, but I didn't want to talk about this. Yeah, but it's, it's not students versus the community, but we're, we're both going to have to mutually respect each other's roles in terms of you as, you, as a higher up and me as a, a journalist. Diana? Uh, yeah, this may be a, a good note to close this discussion on, but literally just a moment ago, um, Lori Oglesby Petter, who was the advisor at Prosper Texas High School, who lost her job uh, defending Neha and her fellow student journalists said, like your presentation here today illustrates why the sacrifice was worth it. And she thanks the Student Press Law Center and New Voices of Texas Volunteers for their work and efforts to secure First Amendment rights for student journalists. That's great. That's great. The importance of that, again, that you had an advisor, and you have said this, the importance of having that advisor who had your back, or an editor, who has the back of their reporters. Do you just want to underscore that to your advisor? Um, who's hopefully listening still. I'm going to cry. No, I <laughs> no, I still think my editors in, in high school and my editors in college, my former first high school advisor, they're like my best friends. You know, they're, I can feel the support from them from here. And it's something that I care so much about. And that's another reason why I was so excited to come here is because of the support from the Student Press Law Center, from different New Voices states, things like that. It's crazy to see how many people really care about student journalism and how much we're gonna keep going. So. And you have been active um, since you resolved your case at Prosper. You have been active, though, nationally in talking about the need for the New Voices legislation. <laughs> Can we get a question from, I see Mary Beth. And yeah. She's, she's royalty here. Yes, she has royalty <laughs> in this audience. Oh, Mary thank Beth. you, thank you. I just want to uh, thank all of you for all of your work and for 
advancing the free press and the First Amendment and, and the youth voices, all of your voices that are so important. It's so wonderful to have journalism and to have advisors, especially in high school. I've learned recently that only 25% of high schools have journalism at all. And Joe, you mentioned that some about Appalachia. And it, um, of course, the schools that don't have it are mostly schools with more kids of color and low income students. There's a high school here in DC called Wilson High School that had a journalism program and they still do. And so they learned about this and they reached out to a school that did not have journalism and they helped them to start a program. I was wondering if you hear about other efforts like this or how you feel about that and if actions are being taken because of course it's good to represent marginalized voices but it's really great for marginalized people um, to be able to have their own voice also. Thank you. Um, I, in Ann Arbor, there's a um, teen community center called the Neutral Zone that's working on starting up a journalism cooperative with students from all the different high schools in the Ann Arbor and the neighboring town of Ypsilanti, um, high schools in the area, because a lot of them, some of them do have programs, but a lot of them don't. And it's really, really exciting to see young people, young, I mean, I'm a young person, people younger than me interested in that and, and seeing um, that they're you know, working to uplift those voices. So I think I do see that happening. It's very exciting. I'm sure, I know you're already being active in trying to pursue new voices, but just the last word from all of you about what we can do next, what we can do tomorrow to make it better and easier and more valuable, more valued in our communities to hear student voices. I mean, our voices are important and they're starting to be heard, so let's keep raising them, you know, <laughs> let's keep trying. Something that Mary Beth has said, you know, young, the voice of young people are, are just, is vastly ignored in today's society. I mean, they're the most drowned out voices. So it's important for us as, you know, student journalists to, you know, to talk to other students and ask them, you know, what, what their opinion, you know, because you hear, you know, adults and lawmakers all the time arguing about, oh, what, what should we do for these kids? Well, I mean, I'm sure the kids have opinions as well, and they, they need to be voiced. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Just continuing to work in our communities and um, putting pen to paper, fingers to keyboard, and, <laughs> and doing the work that, that we do so well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's about recruiting more people to your newspaper staff. Like Maya was saying earlier, there are stories that you always miss, so making sure to look for new angles. And even before sort of the college, high school level, are educating students, young kids, about press freedom and why it's so in uh, critical to our democracy. And helping people, whether they're in journalism or not, to understand the value of a free press and an open press. Um, I have a lot of faith because you guys are so smart and so thoughtful about the future. I have a lot of faith, and I appreciate everything that you've said here, and I'm sure the audience does too. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.